Okay, we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session of today's For Access Global Meeting of 2021. My name is Alec Wang, and I will be the moderator for this panel. The subject of our discussion is the future of work post-COVID, and it is a topic that's equally important, vast, and relevant to the time we're in. So after more than a year of a public health crisis, economic turbulence, physical lockdowns, and emotional stress for many people around the world, we seem to be making some progress heading out of the pandemic. And we're doing that with a new set of priorities, practices, and challenges. For example, how we're seeing physical spaces has changed, whether it's the distance from uh, between us and somebody else in a coffee shop or the distance we choose to live away from our workplace. Technology gets adopted more quickly with AI, automation, platform-based companies, all delivering great benefits to its users while they also carry some potentially negative impacts to others. Meanwhile, gender roles, leadership styles, and uh, rules and policies all have something that we should reconsider and reevaluate so we can shape our society into one that continues to deliver well-being and opportunities for its members. So as we explore these various dimensions of the future of work, I couldn't ask for a better group of participants than those in front of me today, uh, whose experience range from various industries, companies, and locations. Um, so why don't I start with a quick round of introductions, where I will ask each speaker to give a brief opening remark and then we will dig into some uh, very detailed questions. How about that? Um, first, we have Ms. Yeta Ditlev of Ditlev Consulting calling in from Denmark. Uh, for more than 25 years, Yeta, you've been working at a top level within uh, innovation, business development, leadership, and management. Um, and at the core of much of your activities is a passion of building the business of the future through better leadership. And you're, you've been achieving that as a leadership developer, leadership trainer, and future strategy developer, working with companies from multinationals to startups. Welcome, Yeta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Would you like to share some brief words? Well, um, yeah, I would. Um, I think my, my main passion has always been building a bridge to better business. And the better business post covid 19 uh, actually demands very much of us i believe it 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 requires that we uh, we rethink the way we lead companies but it does also require the way that we work so the one part is the leadership part the other part is the hybrid way we need to work post covid i mean Everybody has been working from home offices or many people have been working from home offices now for 15, 16, 18 months. The big question is what will happen afterwards? And in, I think that one of the big trends that we will meet there is that we're going from workplaces to work days. And this actually challenges the way that leaders need to frame their leadership. <clears throat> excuse me, and the way that leaders also need to work with their organizations. So that is actually my main point, I think, for a start. Thank you. Wonderful. We'll dig into that uh, shortly. So next, we have Ms. Christine Cotier, the founder of GEM Partners uh, from the Netherlands. Christine, you have a couple decades of experience in the executive search and talent management arena, as well as work fostering greater gender inclusion, diversity in the corporate sphere. And you help uh, companies becoming more effective by bringing in their key players into harmony with the heart and soul of their organizations, and which I think is an important way of seeing things, especially when we talk about a more human-centered economy. So welcome, Christine. Good to have you here. Thank you, Alec. Thank you. You want me to throw a few things on the table? Yeah, please do. Yeah. Well, um, in addition to Yeta, of course, um, I, I agree with all that you say. And if you, if I may post a question, I want to post three questions where we can dance around a little bit. And the first question would be for me, what people do we need in this 
through this time in this whole system transformation. And the re and the recap, the redistribution, the remembering, the the, the restoring, the reset, and all those re we have entered in 2020 already, the the era of the re, and we're absolutely in the midst of it, and we're starting. Point is, we're in the midst, yet we still need to learn. We are still new to everything that has changed. We are all of a sudden with a big bang in the digital economy. We are changing the way we work. We must change the way we work. So that is and what people do we need um, in this t- time of whole system transformation. So that's the individual. On an organizational level, I just want to put the words harmonized organizations. And what I mean there is, of course, that we start to make different leadership decisions that lead to inclusion, growth. I would say growth equals inclusion and not separation. So not separation. And then we come to the society because here I think the pandemic has taught us so many important lessons. And one of them to me is is so beautiful is that we have seen seen that that family life life work balance has a complete different dimension now you know and and also i i tend to say we 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 have gone through an unmasking time meaning in a very positive way i always use um joe biden was in in the late late night show um, with Stephen Colbert and his daughter phones. A, you know, <laughs> he had his phone on. B, he picked up the phone. Pre-COVID. Well, he's the president of the United States. He needs to be reachable. Right? He, 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 <laughs> he was not yet. He was not yet. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, in that sense, everything has been demasking or unmasking. So I think on a societal level, let's please focus on the inner development and let's have inner development goals and and let's bring our solution. Mm -hmm. Just tick the box with me and bring your solution to the world. But so here's what I see, Alec, on individual organizational societal level. Wonderful. That's uh, several very important dimensions of how we need to consider things. We'll dig into those as well, definitely. Um, well, next, let me bring us to Ms. Bettina Schaller, SVP of the ADECO Group. She is also the president of the World Employment Confederation and vice chair of OECD's uh, Employment, Labor, and Social Affairs Committee, among several positions. So, Bettina, from the titles you have alone, we can already tell now, your work has a lot to do with workforce, employment, regulatory, and the policy level issues, which would be obviously a big component to uh, our approach to the future of work. Uh, I look forward very much to hearing your input. Thank you so much, Alex. And indeed, what a pleasure to be with uh, all of you discussing on the future of work. And no, you're right. I mean, I guess I'm the, the policy geek uh, in this uh, in this uh, round, and it's... <laughs> Uh, indeed, uh, the case that on a daily basis, I um, deal with the structural uh, elements, you know, what do labor markets look like? And now, of course, you know, coming out of the crisis, and we really hope that we can finally say we come out of the crisis, what are they supposed to look like? You know? And one of the pieces we've seen, it's been fascinating how many countries have actually um, provided economic support, both to companies and to workers, clearly something we've never seen before. But you know, unfortunately, in the big picture, if you look at the big data and the whole world, this crisis obviously, you know, has only accentuated inequalities that existed on the labor market before already. You know, hundreds of thousands of people Actually, millions of people, obviously, who had difficulties in accessing the labor market before have it even more now. One of the big issues there is skills. The acceleration that we've seen is a completely new set of skills is necessary. The other piece we've seen is many people actually don't want to go back to their previous job, but to come back. So I look at the frameworks 
talking to policymakers. And one of the things that we already asked for before, but we know now is even more important, is that new social contract. It's that new way of looking at, you know, what are the uh, responsibilities, but also the expectations of workers, of businesses, um, and of course, uh, of government. So tremendously delighted to join this conversation. Back to you, Alec. Well, thank you, Bettina. Those are important things, new social contract policy level issues. I made, I made note of those, and uh, we will have some good questions for you later. Uh, well, now let me introduce our colleague from Poland, Mr. Dariusz Gowaczewicz, the CEO of Smart Aviation and Training Innovative Solutions, which is a company that helps its clients with all matters related to the aviation industry, from flight operations, system management, to training, regulations, etc. cetera. Dariusz, you also have a strong legal background yourself from British and European law, ECJ, uh, taxation, etc. And all of this has given you a unique perspective on many of the things we'll be addressing. So great to have you here, Darius. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be over here and have a chance to say a few words about uh, the, the current situation and the future and the prospect. So actually, there is one Chinese uh, wish, uh, and they wish just to live in the interesting times. And definitely, that's quite interesting time. Of course, we've been going through a very, uh, let's say, hard time because many people died and many people just suffered from the uh, diseases. But anyway, looking at that from the economic point of view, social point of view, uh, it's quite interesting. There are not too many moments all over, all over the history of humankind and that can be compared to this one. Of course, we've got also many crises going together, like the first one was the health crisis, after that one was economic one, after that social, political, so it's quite a difficult situation. Of course, we understand that the order which has been established can no, cannot exist anymore, and we should do something about that. And that's a main question, what we can do about that, and I think it's very difficult to determine the answer and define the steps exactly which should be taken. But anyway, uh, we should uh, learn some uh, adaptive aptitude ad and attitude to certain issues and just try to uh, move forward anyway. Of course, when we look back in the history, for example, if you ask uh, somebody 100 years ago that, uh, or tell somebody that his grandchildren uh, will be a uh, cyber security master or uh, game designer would never believe in that because never he had heard about such professions. Yeah, So maybe there is a, also a big question mark for us that uh, pretty soon we'll see or we'll hear about something we have never imagined. So that's also quite interesting and I'm looking forward to it. Oh, thank you, Darius. Uh, we look forward to those discussions as well. Now, last but definitely not the least, Mr. Francisco Vasquez Medin, the president of the 3G Smart Group. Francisco, your company has presence in more than a dozen countries across Europe and Latin America, specializes in facilitating business changes, transformations through the design of the physical space. And with your projects ranging from workspace, retail to hospitality, residential, and a lot of things in between, you really have a great deal of knowledge in terms of how people's behavior, habits, productivity, et cetera, are affected by the spaces they're in. So I think uh, that's, a, that's a fantastically important uh, topic, not just because I am personally in the real estate industry. Uh, so I very much look forward to hearing your input as well. Welcome. No, for us, for us we, are, we are living in an exciting time, no? because... Um, I think what it, what it happens in really in, in these last months or last year is that it has been accelerate what it was happening from from the past. No, the digital transformation started in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, two thousand ten. So it's a, about ten years ago, twelve years ago. No, and I think this pandemic has accelerated the, this process. No, because uh, technology allowed us to live in another way. No. Uh, Work is a, an activity, not a place, in most of the cases, no? And it's uh, for, the, um, for that, 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 way of, that way of flexible working, which is going to, to happen, in, now it's going to be extended in all the, in all the 
most of the of the companies that it was already before the pandemic in companies like Microsoft with a very good success or, or other companies. Uh, what we are seeing is that uh, people has uh, live uh, or has test tested the flexibility but being at home no in a in a huge macro pilot no which is not has not been very nice because it was an obligated pilot with a virus outside and things like that no? but it has made uh, people think about say okay I can do a lot of things from remote no right. I can take my kids to the school I can stay more at home we will we'll have to see the the level of divorces from the pandemic after the pandemic no because we have a, an intensive life at home no so this has changed the, the the mindset of the people one thing no and it's going to be difficult for companies to say okay let's come back from nine to five from Monday to, to Friday no so this is the first thing and the second thing is that companies have seen that well productivity has go well in some cases even higher than than during the, the pandemic than, than before the pandemic so the productivity was well and also uh, have realized that people don't need uh, somebody telling them what to do and they are quite uh, flexible no so this is really and I hear out the a lot of words that we were hearing before the pandemic the agile world the new leadership ways the new ways of of supervising the new ways of working and things like that, no? But for us and as architects, architects, I think that el, um, there is no doubt at all, and after talking with many, many clients in 25 countries, that all the can all the companies are going to back go back uh, in the future after pandemic, like 50-50, two, three days uh, uh, remote. Be careful with the work, with the work at home, no? I prefer remote, no? remote or at, at the office, no? because remote could be at home or could be in many other places. No? And in about legislation, if you go and say at home, then you appear a lot of problems about legislation. No? So it's better to say you have the flexibility and it's of course voluntary. No? And this affects a lot to the, um, this new, this flexibility, of the work, no, it affects a lot of the way of life that we can get, no, because we are going to have more time with our families. We can do some part remote, some part uh, at, at the office. We can also do some uh, uh, free. We can have free time not only on Saturdays. We can have free time during the week, and we can. Uh, decide at which times we uh, do uh, other things, no? So we are, we are like owners of our time, no? Which is a very important issue, no? And and also it, it will reduce all the uh, all the commuting, the sizes of the headquarters. So it's aligned with sustainability, also. Right. So for us, uh, it's going to be a change in residential, also. Uh, because of the new ways of working, because we are going to have a more uh, spend more time at our home, no, and uh, many changes, no, and we have this really the opportunity because of the change of the way of working, no, of the right. future of work, of the present of work, we have the possibility of change the world, no. Yeah, that's great, Francisco. I think you're already answering some of the questions I I, po I, I wrote down for you in the future. How, how <laughs> much people come back versus being remote? Um, well, I appreciate I appreciate that, and also uh, from the opening remark, we already uh, brought up a lot of good questions and areas. Let's dig into um, technology first and its deeper impact to our society. Uh, Christine, I'll come to you. We have this. Uh, uh, conversation slightly earlier. Uh, can human beings and AI and automation really work well together over the long run, given that there are some uh, underlying tension and potential conflicts of interest? What would be a good equilibrium for us through this? 
Um, in my point of view, uh, there is no way back. That uh, is, uh, uh, to be realistic, eh? we will work together. I think for many people, it will be very good that we have more um, robotics around us. People can therewith change their focus into caring for more each other. And eh? remember the harmonized organizations, the balanced communities, working from the inner to the out, um, be, be more integrated. But most of all, I think where it really comes together is that you need information. So we build that. Hmm? And then we need wisdom. And when that, when those two entities can work together, I think then we can start to believe in a, in a balanced world where uh, robots and, um, and other, um, other intelligence than ours can be um, really of help with the progression of our humanity. But I have difficulties to understand how that will work on a more systematic level. But, uh, you know, I find it hard to say that it's fine to work with robots, whereas for a whole layer of workers, it's fine to work and earn money <laughs> that otherwise robots are doing. So I, I don't have my eye there, but I'm really curious to hear from you. But in the long run, Alec, I believe in information and wisdom blended together. I appreciate that. Yeah, let's explore that and let's try to find some better uh, clarity as well. Obviously, the question always existed before the pandemic, if automation would accelerate unemployment, exacerbate inequality, for example. Darius, let me bring you in on this one. Uh, the pandemic definitely accelerated the gap between higher skilled and lower skilled workers, those with and without educational and training access. How can we, what do we need to do to achieve a better distribution of uh, material well-being and access to opportunities? So I think it's a very, it's, it's a very good, good question. It's also the question about the re redistribution of the income. If we are talking about uh, automation and also about uh, some loss of jobs, the question is who is going to uh, give money to uh, those people that are not able to make uh, money. And of course, uh, this issue should be addressed anyway. But also there is, there is a question if our talk uh, isn't uh, premature because it's like somebody compared talking, talking about uh, victims of artificial intelligence to just a conversation about overpopulation of the moon. Uh, because we are just at the beginning of the entire story. It's a very long journey. Yeah? We're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, but in the future we're going to have something like artificial general intelligence, what means that we'll have in artificial intelligence uh, in every corner of our life, uh, every corner of our city, and so on. It's quite different. Uh, but please also uh, remember what was like uh, 200 years ago, two centuries ago. And I got one uh, quotation, Thomas Carlyle, I was writing in 1983 that demon of, about demon of mechanism whose destructive power was guilty of oversetting whole multitudes of workmen. And the question is, we are 200 years later and we are still alive and a lot of people has got job. Of course, there are some like jobless areas and so on. But please remember what happened just uh, at the moment when the car was discovered. Everything was based on horses, and that was a huge horse industry, and so on. And at one moment, just somebody discovered discovered the car, yeah, and the entire horse-related industry collapsed. And what? It means that those people just found new jobs, redefined, and the entire market, and that's it. And I'm thinking that it's gonna happen as as well uh, in the future, pretty soon. And coming back to your question. I think that we should also try to concentrate uh, as well on the voc vocational training and apprenticeship because not everybody has to go to the university. That's the question, yeah? Because uh, in the future, we'll just much more should be focused on the uh, different set of skills, like vocational skills. And I think that Germany goes this, goes this way, exactly because they've invested a lot of money in the system of vocational training. And the second thing, inclusion. Inclusion is the most important thing. 
in all areas because being excluded uh, may also uh, be seen in many aspects of our life. Today, exclusion is not only uh, exclusion is not only economic one. Exclusion can be technical, digital one, which is very important right now. If we are talking about artificial intelligence, so like the obvious thing is that everybody should have a great access to the great internet. So it cannot work. Can work. What about African countries? Sam? It's uh, scarcity of the access of the internet and so on. There are many questions should be answered. Yeah, I appreciate that input. I think many would agree with many of the points you, you pointed out, Darius, and also the question of whether technological advances would replace jobs and make people worse off or they would just simply find new jobs uh, is mm -hmm. one that we continue uh, continuously have every time there's uh, major breakthroughs. I think that has a lot to do with your, uh, Bettina, your everyday uh, work, right? Uh, there's a question, there's a um, people are thinking the mix of occupations would shift more drastically than previously thought, namely the lower, uh, lower wage, lower skilled worker would decline, while a lot of the gains would happen in the higher tier. I wonder from the policy standpoint, what do we need to do to ease the workforce transition, uh, provide sufficient resource for people to do that and avoid uh, mass drop offs from the labor force? Yeah, no, look, it might sound a bit odd to you if you ask the question what policymakers should do uh, when it comes to that question. And I mean, first of all, um, I'd like to actually say they need to give labor market reform priority. And why am I saying that? It's because, uh, you know, we've seen obviously that this crisis was, was about health and safety. It was about the sanitary situation. The next thing was about the labor market. I've talked about um, those measures in uh, in many countries, but still there is not enough focus by governments around the world on the fact that now the full attention needs to be on the labor market, on that human, on that skills component of whatever um, measures you're going to take. And, you know, one example here, maybe just to bring in, everybody's talking about the need to um, to uh, green the economy, for instance. Well, we find it absolutely astounding how so few governments have actually looked at the, the skills component of what it needs to be greening that economy, for instance. So, you know, obviously, and it won't surprise you, um, from my perspective, it's really about there's a big, big shift that needs to happen. Structural reforms need to happen in most of the countries. Not every, in every country, of course, there's a few that are doing well, um, but most of the country, because here you will have heard it before. The frameworks that we have today are the frameworks of post Second World War. And we've had this before the crisis. We were saying it. How can we, you know, continue to live in an environment that was built when all this automation and digitization um, uh, discussion was at a completely different pace. And of course, Darius brought in the horses. Literally, almost the frameworks we have today were built for a world with horses. So, you know, let's let's finally change that. And, uh, you know, it's there's there's plenty of examples or enough examples, as I say, of um, measures that can be taken. Just starting, for instance, with um, uh, the support that should be given, as you say, to people who are in the transition, where well, we say it needs to be so-called active labor market support. So don't just, excuse my French, you know, throw money at the people and incentivize them for staying at home, which is, if I may say, something or uh, the reality we're seeing in the United States right now. It's, you know, link whatever benefits they will receive to them also notably um, taking the step of um, um, uh, engaging in a career transition, you know, getting assessments, analyzing the gap they're in, looking at, of course, where they, you know, fit into the need of visibility we have of jobs today. And then, of course, always the big topic these days, re and upskill. And governments are here to give that framework, you know, to, to allow for <clears throat> ways in which uh, individuals can do that, there, for example, we talk about so-called individual learning accounts. That could be a way, you know, um, to, to incentivize people. Um, and of course, again, um, make sure that this framework supports all the businesses that are in this uh, transformation phase. 
Oh, what well, uh, a great input. And speaking of active labor policy, I think Denmark is a country that's doing uh, excellently well on that. So I'll come to you, Yeta. Uh, mm-hmm. Anything you would uh, like to add on Bettina's input and also in terms of leadership, which is your, uh, your specialty, it is mm-hmm. very important how we implement the policies, the considerations and the mm-hmm. technological advances. So obviously the, the ideas, examples and the actions put forward by leaders have great influence on how mm-hmm. we engage with our societal changes. So I wonder amidst all of the uh, shifts and changes that's been happening, what do leaders have to pay attention to, to practice to, um, to uh, ensure a successful delivery of all these uh, great efforts? I do actually think that, I mean, we, we can take leaders in different levels. So we can take the governmental or the public level and we can go into companies. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I do completely agree with uh, Bettina. And I can give you one example of what actually happened in Denmark. And we have been doing this transformation now for, I mean, in several industries for many, many years. And one huge industry that was hugely transformed in Denmark, that was the textile industry. Because the textile industry has been outsourced several times. And uh, nowadays, uh, it's rather funny when we say that we have more people employed in the Danish uh, fashion and textile industry than we had when we had people sitting with the sewing machines. So... It's actually twice as much, uh, oh, twice, twice as many people are employed now in the textile industries. They're just doing different jobs. And this is due to what exactly what Bettina uh, says, that is the active labor market policy. And that is working in, it's actually a symbiosis between the governmental level and the industrial level. So you need to have that partnership. And just to to grab the the point that Bettina made too about the green development or uh, let's just go into sustainability, it's going to be the same here because we also need to measure things differently now. In my opinion, there's a huge trend going from more to better. We do not need more. I cannot eat more. I don't need more chairs, more cars, more whatever. I need a better life for me, for my family, for my society, for the globe. So the the planet needs us to rethink. And that upskilling or reskilling needs education. And that is, that also challenges the leadership that we have from a strategic point of view. So we need to think more out of the box, finding these solutions, meaning that we also have to co- collaborate in the organizations, the relations between employees, uh, management, leaders, whatever, that it needs to be a more collaborative uh, space. And it needs to be a space where it's safe, where trust has, can be built and where we can fail. We need to fail. In failure lies the success. And that is actually the huge, as I see it, the huge, um, the, well, maybe not the, the worst problem, but it's a very huge problem. When I go out in, in, uh, and working with executives, because the pressure going into results coming from, stakes, from, from stockholders or from owners is still too way way too much uh, going into stock value going into uh, earnings etc so what we need to is that we actually have to set a new frame we need to focus on more purpose we need to focus focus on planetary so it's actually going from kpis to kbis we need to go from key performance indicators to key behavior indicators. So instead of just focusing on earnings, we actually need to focus on how is my behavior towards new ambitions. And that is, for me, uh, the, the absolute main challenge that we have as leaders and executives, that is having the courage to walk a new way. 
If you don't have the courage to walk a new way, you never go forward. Another example is that we have actually four years ago, there was a Danish company saying, we're not going to have any meeting anymore, uh, more than 20 minutes. Hmm. No, no meeting lasts more than 20 minutes. <laughs> the efficiency effect of that was so huge that they have four days work every week. Four days work. They do not work Fridays. Nobody worked Fridays because productivity was in that case so increased. Uh, so they are actually having the same wages uh, or as earnings and they only work four days a week. So that's a new, and I, when I heard that, I said, that's not going to happen. It's not possible. What about the customers? And they call or whatever. It works. And it's, by the way, it's a tech company. It's an IT company. So the courage to find new solutions together with the employees, because that's setting so much energy free. Let's just walk that way. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Yet a very insightful input. And, uh, well, Francisco, I'll come to you and tie in some of the things we're talking about with your work. Um, speaking of priorities and how people implement changes, um, within the real estate and design sphere, we talk a lot about, you know, IoT, building information modeling, or AI-powered data analytics that could make uh, our physical space perform better. Do you, uh, what are some of the things you pay more attention to you think is promising and a more Provocative question might be, do you think some of these uh, technologies would be benefiting a larger group or a smaller population? For example, only the buildings that are upscale enough to adopt these changes or the companies with money to invest in these? Okay. No, interesting. Interesting the, the question and interesting all what you have already all, all said, no? And I love more to more the change the more to better, no? That you say yet. I think it's, I think, well, all, all of the technology is, we have lots of technology, we have a huge amount of technologies, artificial intelligence, robotics, everything. Technology is not a, I don't think it's a, it's a problem. If you have to automatize or do something, there's not, there's not a problem. What happens with the pandemic and connected with the pandemic is people have embraced the technology, no? Because you can create a lot of technology, but if the people doesn't, if you are not solving any problem to the people, the people are not going to use the technology. So it's so it's have to be concentrated into the into people, no? And pandemic has made us in a very simple technology, which have been Zoom, Teams, very simple things, but people have used intensive the technology, and because of the pandemic, they are open also to change, which is the, the mindset is open for a change. And in the, in the, in the company is the same, you know, they're open for a change. They're open for introducing a uh, new ways of working or new, new ways of technology or adding more technology, you know, and uh, connected also with talent. It happens also is that uh, talent became, became global because if, uh, now I can contract. I can I, I can con I can work for three different companies. I can work for a company in Denmark by without going to Denmark with my family and living in Denmark. No, so the rules have changed, and the ways of working have changed, and the ways of, of we have lots of possibilities. As I said before, no, and technology related to the to the workplace and to the to the real estate. I think the most important thing is. Um, is for the for the real estate guys, the ones that are are, are really uh, building buildings, are commercial centers or headquarters, is to under, understand what is happening in the in the in the office or in the spaces, no? Which places are they using? Which places are they are not using? And try to adapt the space as much as possible. In IoT, 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 for example, there's a lot of sensor, there's a lot of things like that, no? But the best sensor is this. It's our own phone, okay? So really, uh, there's a lot of companies trying to sell a lot of elements, a lot of things, a lot of, it's like the smart city, no? 
for the smart city, everybody wants to install lots of control, lots of things, and this is the sensor, okay? As, as, as easy as that, no? But you have to make the people working with this sensor. You have to make them uh, using an application. We will give the data and everything. And the data is there because all the Google has all our data. No? No. So really, yeah, they know where we are and they know what we buy and they know a lot of things. No? So in technology in the, in the real estate side is all connected with the people. And I think in most of the other places, no, you have to create things that helps the life and increase the, the, the quality of life of the people, no. And when the people see that robotic, half a robot or half a artificial intelligence or half things like that near you, nearby, it help them to have a better life, they will got it, no. And in in real estate is the same, no. There is a lot of people creating technology, but uh, for me, it's the people. For me, I agree with the age, with the, his life, his quality of life, is uh, really concentrate on that. No? Right. That's a very important way of seeing it, focusing on how it uh, affects people. So, uh, Bettina, I understand your company is advocating for a new social contract, speaking of relationship between companies, people, and society. Could you share us, uh, with us more about that? I'd, I'd love to and uh, you know, take another hour because indeed um, we're the first company out there that's actually built a framework you know, where we looked at really the two components of the contract, which is the expectations and the responsibilities. And we looked at four individuals for the work, really, what are those expectations? And maybe I'll just you know, share those with you. One, you know, you want to have an active uh, training and career support from governments and businesses to realize your own labor market aspirations. Sounds obvious to us, but trust me, most countries, that framework is not given. You want to have the ability to organize your work safely and flexibly and to have your voice heard. Again, many countries, that is not the case. And then, this seems obvious as well, you want income security, fair remuneration from formal work. 60% of the people, of workers in the world are in the informal market. Here we talk about mm -hmm. formal work. And you want what we say are smooth labor market transitions. So on this individual, let me just mention the responsibilities as well that we identified. And there we say, and that's very important, you know, for us, the days are over where father and mother state are going to deliver everything to you. It's really about taking ownership of your own employability and your skills development through active career planning. You know, too many people are still passive thinking, waiting that, you know, the employer or the state or government are, are going to do something. Those days are over. And then, you know, make sure that the, the social security contributions match whatever you're doing, uh, regardless of your contract and employer status. Employment status, sorry. And that might sound a bit complicated, but here we're talking about, you know, everybody who's happy to do a gig and something, you know, pocket the money, maybe earn a bit more, uh, not declare it again, you know. Uh, but then when things go bad, you expect the government again to actually help you. That's not going to work going forward anymore. And then, you know, again, just be engaged, productive take ownership. So we have this, you know, same uh, approach when it comes to the employers, expectations, responsibilities, and governments. Let me stop it here, but actually do visit, I don't want to do it, it shouldn't be a, you know, a pitch, but do visit our, our website at decagroup.com and, and look for that framework, um, because I think it's really interesting. Um, and it's one that um, is a fantastic base of discussion. Many, you know, uh, initiatives that need to come from that but it's good to have it all bundled in such a way. Yeah, thank you. I encourage you to pitch it. I, I've read it, and I think it's a very important read. Uh, Christine, I'm sure you have some thoughts about this as well, because you mentioned how we uh, might achieve a better, a more harmonized organization and a more balanced community. So what do you think we need to collectively do to achieve that? All that Bettina says. <laughs> Great answer. What I think that we collectively need to do is, um, for example, one, one major thing, bring in the feminine principle, 
where we where we look at stuff like go for the outcome and it's already been said here go for the outcome don't go for time change time to trust uh, if we if we can do that then we can have a, a foundation we can build a base on what what Bettina calls actively learning you know and it's an actively learning for your whole life so the whole graph if you wish has changed you know where we where we well we or our parents where we, where we studied we were academically formed and then started to work and you work till what 65 here 67 now eh? and now there is a different balance the graph will will change we need to keep on learning and also we need to learn different things we in